All right, welcome to the August 8th, 2020 Developer Sync meeting. So, how's it going? Awesome. Right. <laughs> All right. Great. Uh, so, we done? All of it. Is Time to done. ship it. Excellent. Okay. Um, so Chris has been working on the schema for our new and improved wakeword tagging system. Um, and uh, Ken's been working, I assume, on the uh, wakeword uh, training system. Um, so yeah, why don't we just go around and uh, get an update on how things are going there. So let's start with Ken. Okay, let me see if I can drag and drop just a minute. <laughs> I made a little video for everybody. Ooh, fun. Yeah, so let's move this guy out of here. Oh, come on. Uh, well, can I just drag and drop you over here then? Let's see. So how do I do that? It'll be here. Okay. And this. Well, I don't think that worked. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I only did that once during my my VC call today. <laughs> Guess I'll just cut this section out of the video. Welcome back. I don't think that went as expected. Did, did the video make it into the chat room? Uh, no, but you disconnected. Yeah, and it just started playing the video when I drug it into chat. All right, well, oh. I will describe what said video demonstrate. And <laughs> I am planning, actually, on doing a YouTube video. Uh, but what I did is I created the first uh, rough draft of the Precise Studio. And it is a UI. Uh, so basically, if you check out the code line for Precise, you'll get a new directory called train. And under there, you'll have a UI directory. In there, you just type in um, Precise Studio, enter. And then you go and bring up a browser of your choice. And on localhost 8000, you'll have the Precise Studio. Uh, let me bring it up real quick. And I'll explain what all it has about it and, and what all it does. But um, yeah, so well, of course I'll have to run it. Bear with me. But basically, it allows you to create and do everything um, from a UI instead of having to do anything off the command line. Um, so that's annoying that that video didn't work because it demonstrated everything I'm going to show you, but okay, or tell you, but. So when you bring it up, um, you have a, uh, a menu that allows you to go to models or test data sets or training data sets. Uh, there's the measure accuracy page, which you guys have already seen, record sample. So the concept here is it's running locally on your machine and you're creating models on your own uh, on your machine for whatever you want and you can install them there or whatever. Now, um, part of this pay, one of the um, options is record samples. So when you go there, it'll, it'll say, okay, press, you know, record, and then you can record, and then you can say stop, and then you can say save it, and you can build up really quickly using, you know, your browser, your samples. Then you go into like training data sets, and you say, okay, move this file from samples over here, move this file from samples over there, and you construct your data sets all using UI. 
And then you go into your model directory and you say, create a new model and use this training data set or change the training data set for the model. Okay, train the model. Then you can test the model against the, the test data sets and get numbers. And the last feature I'll be adding is where you can actually do an interactive test. But ultimately, the goal would be that you could click a button and say, download it into your Mark II. And it would replace your, your wake word with the custom wake word you created. So you could actually create a custom wake word, uh, not being a programmer, uh, and probably do it in about 15 minutes. And then you could, you know, iterate through and add more samples or delete samples or balance or whatever you want to do. So um, I'll have a video. This, this, this code should be done by next week. Um, and I should have a video by this time next week on YouTube that demonstrates how to use it. And then we can figure out what to do from there. But it's uh, pretty much the culmination of what I'm working on, which is for non-programmers uh, to be able to create custom wake words using Precise and deploy them to either their Mark II or their Mark I or their uh, Mycroft Core installation. So that's uh, what I've been working on. I was going to do some more models, but I haven't gotten enough feedback from the models I've put out yet. Although I did get positive feedback from Gez. Michael, have you installed the new model, and, and how is it working? Uh, I have not had a chance, uh, to, had a chance to, to test the new model. Test the new model. Okay. Well, once I get some more feedback, that'll let me know. But I'm pretty much going to probably make a bunch of models this weekend. But I wanted to get the actual precise studio going so I could use it to do them uh, and make sure it can handle large data sets and things like that. So, yeah, that's what I've been working on. Um, the the NAS issue, th this is kind of the, uh, the hemorrhoid of my life lately, um, is not... It's not going quietly into this good night. So I, I got an email from Josh. It says, whatever you do, don't bork the NAS. And here's how you can get into it, which made me think, I think what I really want is to ask Josh to have somebody physically go over to the data center and copy the NAS uh, directory onto a thumb drive and get it away from all that water. And then once he's done that, I will go and execute my script that will begin moving those files out into the directory structure that, that Chris V and I had agreed upon, um, because that's going to be a destructive move. It's going to move them from that main directory into their new subdirectories. So, you know, if something could go wrong, if we have a backup, that would be wonderful. Um, the assumption is it won't take 26 days, even though that's what the original estimates are, because the belief is as the subdirectory shrinks in size, since I'll be moving files out of it, it will perform faster as I go. So I don't really know how long it's going to take. I know just straight copying, it took four days to get about half of the files out. So, and part of that was that the problem was as the target directory was getting filled, it was taking longer and longer, right? Because now it had two really big directories it had to deal with. So the assumption is if I move, that will um, go faster. But that'll be destructive, and so I'd love to get Josh to have somebody back that up to removable media somehow before I start this destructive move. So that's kind of my status, and hopefully this time next week I can point you to a link on YouTube that will show you what I've done, and then Gez will actually hopefully check out the branch and test it himself. So that's where I'm heading. Okay. Yeah, that sounds really great. Um, I was going to say we can uh, um, the model. Oh. <laughs> I've sent the model to a couple of um, to a couple of people, but we should just post it in the precise channel. I think and say anyone that feels like testing it out, let us know. Okay, now I have a page that I did for Josh, which is for the uh, project that's going ongoing, which was a description, a page that describes how to install them. And here they are, uh, the PB file and the PB param. And then Josh's feedback was, you should probably put this on GitHub. So it sounds like maybe I should create a wiki page on GitHub, Gez, and put that up there. And then we can post the link to that in the uh, precise uh, chat room. Uh, yeah, you can put it in the precise repo wiki, um, or if it's worth putting in the main documentation, then we can we can do that. Okay, I'll put it in the uh, in the repo for now. 
Uh, Chris V, I believe you had a question or two, probably. Uh, what did I write this in? Well, that and did we let Derek have a, a shot at designing uh, the UI for this stuff so that we're consistent across our web applications? Right. Uh, so the answer to the first question is it's just Python code um, using the uh, built-in simple HTTP server. So you don't have to install anything. It comes as the, uh, when you check out the branch, it comes as part of the precise code line. Uh, and I didn't want to have to put a bunch of onerous requirements in there for, you know, web servers and things like that. So it's just a Python script. You just run it from the command line, dot forward slash precise studio dot pi, and it runs. Um, the second, this, the answer to your second question is, yes, I would love for Derek to have at it. And once it's done, uh, which I'm anticipating is sometime next week, I will walk him through getting it running and then get all of his feedback and implement it because it is basically just plain vanilla right now. Uh, so yeah, uh, it could use some love, some CSS love and some UI love and UX love and all that. So I hope that answers. Uh, well, in order to get some of that love, we well, one of our things we do now is is material design. I don't know if the Python is going to support that or not. So we'll have to see. Is it is the intention this will this will just running locally right now, right? When you yeah, in other words, the intent is that everybody enable the masses. Everybody can create their own custom wake words. Really, where I'm going with this is I'd love to be able to get a Mark II and be able to have it installed into the Mark II. Because I look at the Mark II as an appliance, right? Um, you know, I would think most people are never gonna SSH into it or get into it. Um, yeah. You know, it's a consumer device. So anything that I'm looking at Mark II related would be existential or external to the Mark II and would allow you to modify your Mark II. So this would run locally. You basically check out the branch um, that I haven't created yet, which is a just a branch of the precise code line. You run the precise setup.py. Uh, and then um, once you have precise running, then you would just run this uh, by saying, you know, precise studio. And then you would bring up a browser and go to localhost 8000. And everything it's doing, it's doing on your local machine. So it's your personalized version of your files. You're not sharing with anybody. Uh, you're creating your own wake words locally. And then you can push them wherever you want. Yeah. So it's a local, yes, local studio, right? I, I think, okay. you know, I, that doesn't make sense. What's that? So that, that does make a difference because it's not really necessarily one of our, you know, internet web applications at that point. It's right, just something but it, that's running yeah, but, but it does need locally. Some UI. So I think that may change. No, agreed. But it, yeah. it could use some UI attention. It's it's very, yeah, it's very vanilla. Uh, so at a minimum, CSS style, right, to match what we have. But um, nothing nothing elaborate. It's it's really just straightforward. Five okay. functions. Well, it sounds right. like there's. So that's, yeah, there, there's some core capabilities here that we're going to need okay. for our uh, our eventual web uh, collection and tagging system, right? So the the ability to collect samples and review them and sort them and tag them, I think is it sounds like you have those those functions in there, and I think that you know, uh, do you have a migration path for like taking what you've done now and 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 turning that into what will be our eventual web application? So I don't have a roadmap because I don't know where we want to go with it. I don't know if it's something that we wanted to sell like a developer studio, like uh, like a .NET developer studio. Maybe it could become the beginnings of that. Uh, maybe uh, piggyback a, a skill developer studio onto it so that you could develop skills on your local computer using a UI and then download them into your Mark II. Uh, wake words, whatever else. So I didn't know um, if it was ever going to migrate anywhere besides your local computer. Um, and so I don't really have a migration path to move it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. As far as the tagging goes, that's strictly a personal issue regarding how you choose to name your files when you record them. Remember, you're recording them in a browser mm -hmm. and then you're saving your local machine. So you control what they're called and where they go. Okay. Well, it sounds like we should have a, a meeting to discuss the roadmap for this, uh, because 
this I think will be a really useful tool that a lot of people want, but um, you know, let's figure out how it's going to fit into the overall, you know, grand plan of involving the community in collecting wake words and tagging and whatnot. Um, yeah, this is kind of this is kind of a side that a side of that because it doesn't really do anything that that data flow works on. This is just for you to create custom wake words locally. But we can talk about it because um, once I have it up and we can see it and I can post a video, like I said, on YouTube, then we can discuss where we want to go with it from there. Yeah. OK, well, and we also need to discuss what's the priority of, you know, uh, enabling people to create their own work words. I think that it's a it is a useful feature, but I, I'd rather do it in the context of our overall system rather than, you know, it being something that only developers can can really interact with. And then, you know, if you're creating a, your own wake word and Versus, you know, if you're if it's a low level tool that we're expecting only developers to use, then that's one thing. And we can, you know, spend a little bit of time on it and wrap it up and put a bow on it and set it aside. But um, but I think that we can do more than that. I think that we can make a tool that uh, everyone can use. And uh, but in order to do that, we need to figure out how it fits into, you know, the Mycroft. Uh, you know, is it a is it a new skill? Do we package it as a skill that people can install to train new wake words? Uh, or do we make it a part of Selene, um, you know, uh, or expose it as a separate service through Selene, you know, that kind of thing. Like, what is the architecture overall for the for the data flow, and what's going to be useful for our end users, um, and you know, how how to best service them? Because if you know, if I'm creating a wake word, I'll want to deploy it to all of my devices, right? Presumably, and um, or potentially, right? Uh, so, um, you know, we just need to think about those things. Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, I think it'll be so it's part of, part of it. making money off of it as well, maybe. So, you know, if we give people too many tools to be able to do things themselves, then that may minimize our ability to say, oh, yeah, we can create a wake word for you. Right. Yeah. 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 Again, well, I think, or that I think it'd be cool. best that next week when it's done and ready to show, everybody gets a look at it and then we can all step back and say, okay, here's what I think about that. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, prepare? Can you, uh, you think it'll be ready to do a demo on Monday? No, I was thinking more like next Friday. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's, um, but I right. can do a demo next Friday for sure. I can commit to that. I just don't want to overcommit and under deliver and Monday's a bit tight. Right. I, I guess what I'm concerned with right now is, you know, this seems to be uh, a little bit of a, a sidetrack from where we're going with the wake word. So, uh, you know, with, with the overall system. And so if it's a matter of like, you don't have enough direction to, you know, uh, then I think we should have a discussion about that. But if you think that this is a really useful tool and it's worth, you know, spending an extra week on it, then I'd, I'd still like to have a discussion about that as well. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Do you want A or A? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, what I would say is that I'm, um, yeah, I, I think it's very useful. Um, the thing is, I'm in a pseudo holding pattern um, on, the, uh, on, on the NAS stuff, and also a little bit of a pseudo holding pattern. I'm ready to. Uh, implement the third piece of the roadmap for precise, but I'm in a holding pattern until Chris has made some progress and we get the data moved out. And that third uh, bullet point, I guess, or third project is the triggering of, okay, new data has been gathered, a level has been hit, a trigger has been generated, create a new model and test it and decide what to do with it. So I'm ready to do that, um, but I'm blocked a little bit. So. That's why I kind of you know, said, hey, rather than just building models, uh, let me just do a really easy non-programmer interface so everybody could build models. Um, and that's, that's where I came from this. It's just kind of the culmination of what I had learned. You know? So even the hyperparameters are extended to the model training process. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. We can talk, if you'd prefer, um, maybe Monday or Tuesday um, about the direction and stuff just to make sure I'm not going too far astray, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Okay. Okay, uh, Chris Vare. 
Or you're not here. Okay, that was easy. Uh, guess. I'm muted telling you that you're muted. I think I think it's been a while since I've done that. Um, uh, but mostly good this week. Um, so the the process um, status, uh, the the readiness check PR. Um, okay, and I kind of redid that a fair bit. Um, uh, essentially, um, okay, I had some ideas around uh, a different impl implementation. So. So all the statuses are now um, implemented as as internums, integer enumerators. So they're kind of like um, they're comparable against each other. So it just makes it a lot easier. Where you know if you have a status of ready, um, then it also means that the clearly the status um, the process has already started and the process is alive if the process is also ready to to, to do things. Um, Anyway, so there's I, I put a link to the to the PR and um, documentation in the ticket on Jira. Um, I added public documentation to it already because it just seemed way easier to get it to everyone. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's feeling pretty strong now, um, and so hopefully Chris can have a look and and we'll get that in very soon. Um, what else? Uh, also been working with OK on the on the plugin, the audio system plugin uh, changes, um, and he's just put forward some some initial documentation on that, which is great. Um, so hopefully we'll have that in before 2008 as well. Uh, we were talking about the the structure of of repositories for those plugins um, because I'm conscious that we don't want a separate repo for every single plugin and extend our already copious amount of repos. Uh, so I might put some detail around that uh, somewhere and, and get everyone's feedback on that. Um, uh, what else has happened? Uh, I've been working with El Ticino on the on the George Ann voice. Um, we, we're having some weird uh, issues with commas, and it turned out that that uh, half the commas were a completely different random character. So, uh, you know, normalizing your data always helps, um, but just wasn't wasn't really expected. Uh, so, but anyway, so, that, so that's probably the the worst of this week. But um, progress there. Uh, Actually, we're, well, I also worked on the, the QT. Um, I had a quick look at booting the QT image from USB and um, I couldn't get that immediately working. Uh, so I'll, I'll go back to, I'm going to have a chat to the blue systems and, and OK and stuff and, and see if they have any ideas. Um, so I'm not wasting too much time on that because um, someone might already know it. Uh, and also looking at screen rotation so we can go full 360, not just sort of back and forth, um, which seems very easy to do. That's it, I think. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, I've been having some problems with my Mark II uh, GUI interface. The device itself seems to work fine on the audio side, but the, the GUI is not. Uh, updating reliably so um let me take that offline but uh yeah. derek derek what's uh what's the good words hey so for ken yeah i i would love to take a look at that ui um once we decide the priorities there and you know i think what to what chris was talking about earlier whether it's local whether it's on the web whatever we all we all kind of want everything to have a similar look and feel experience so yes, I would, I would gladly help out when the time is ready for that. Um, yeah, did that movie come through? Oh, I didn't see. Oh, uh, okay. Post in the chat. Yeah, it yeah it's a WebM. 
Oh, it looked like a link to a local file to me. Ah, uh, all right. Well, I was hoping that. All right, I'll, like I said, I'll put a video together. But yeah, definitely Derek, for sure. Cool. So um, <clears throat> what I've been working on still is, you know, mostly the hardware world with the project rollover um, almost almost officially done. Uh, I have the, the next three prototypes ready to go. Uh, I didn't quite make it today to get them shipped, so I will ship them tomorrow. Um, we were actually waiting until yesterday for one part. We didn't have some heat sinks, so I wanted to make sure we got those in to keep it consistent with the rest. Um, so what I've been doing in the meantime is just working on what would be the first uh, enclosure that we use for testing um, for the first kind of validation tests of the SJ201 design, uh, which I've laser cut one of those today, and I've started putting one of those together. Uh, so I'll probably send the first one over to Kevin, um, but Kevin also has like access to all of the stuff to make, make them himself. So I'll also give him the instructions um, to make subsequent ones for more testing in the future. But I'll give him the first one because uh, he's busy with other things right now. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's really kind of taken up most of my time is working on that. Um, I don't know. Do you want to give a quick update, Michael, on on where Kevin's at? Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, so Kevin has finally received all of the parts for the SJ two hundred one. He's tested the top half of the board, and that seems to be working okay. He's found a couple of bugs, um, things that are fixable in place. So that's good. Um, he's uh, so basically he's verified that the voltage regulators are working and the USB sound card is recognized by Windows. So that's a good start. Um, the uh, the very interest, you know, the more interesting parts with the, the XMOS chip and that sort of thing are on the to-do list. Those are the some of the parts that he has to hand solder on himself. So uh, he'll keep us apprised of that. But, um, but so far, so good. It's coming up. Yep, yeah, and so I um, once I kind of wrap up this laser cut design, I'll start back on the detailing of the actual uh, enclosure design that will be the kind of pipeline to production. So yeah, that's me. Michael, I have a question about our functionality very quickly. Sure. When, when a Mark II is uh, brought into the room, and it is connected to the same network or via a USB cable, does it function as a speaker and microphone for the host operating system? I think that would be a really cool feature. I don't think that that is part of the existing core functionality right now. Okay, so we'd have to probably develop a, well, <laughs> We could develop a device driver, but the slicker way to do it would be to piggyback the generic device driver kind of old stuff and just report over the USB port as if we're a speaker and a microphone. Exactly. You don't, have yeah. to have a, you don't have to have a device driver on the host, right? Right, exactly. Well, we can't, you know, we can't do that right now. If you, unplug, if you unplug our little USB connection to the Pi and just plug it into your computer, as yeah. long as you have, wouldn't it, wouldn't that work? Possibly? Yeah. Well, there's there's some internal software routing you'll have to do, right? So are, yeah, yeah. The the we yes, the Mycroft does appear if you plug it into the USB port as a USB sound device with input and output capabilities, but that doesn't oh, mean cool. that the Mycroft core is actually paying attention to that at all, right? No, so, understood. But the point is, worst case, you could just not run Mycroft core and use it as a speaker and a microphone. I believe so. Very cool. OK, so uh, Chris is back. Um, let's see if we can get to him before the internet does. OK, hi, everybody. Um, I don't think my parents' network is used to my level of internet usage. <laughs> I just 
rebooted the router. Hopefully that'll get me going for a little while. Um, so uh, lots of good in the last few days. Um, I've published the uh, newer version of the schema um, using um, the in input from last meeting. Um, haven't heard any feedback yet, so I'm hoping that's a good thing. Um, but I have started uh, coding based on that schema. Um, so I have all the DDL written. I've got my local database with the new, um, not all, not the whole new schema. Right now I'm just building what I need for the uh, collection piece, which is the wake word table and the sample table. Um, and so I've got all the DDL built for that. Um, and I changed uh, existing code to deal to, that use the old work wake word table to use the new one. And that's all committed. And right now I'm I'm working on the uh, the endpoint to go to in the device API that will um, that will replace the current endpoint that's being used to upload the audio and it has authentication and all that good stuff in it. So um, so that's almost code complete. I'll have to write some tests around it, et cetera. But um, making really good progress on that. So after that API is written, then the remaining thing will be the script that copies or that, well, that moves the data from the uh, from the machine where it's stored to the NAS. Um, so and then that'll be most of what this first sprint is. I also reorganized the sprint in JIRA. I know we haven't been looking at JIRA much recently, but um, when I originally put the sprint together in JIRA, um, I, I put it together as moving the entire uh, precise API over at once. But um, I think it made more sense just to move over what I needed for this piece and then move over the rest when I'm ready for the tagger. Um, so I rearranged the tasks there a little bit um, to make more sense for what I'm actually doing right now, which is the upload piece. Um, so I did some of that, and that's that should all be up to date now. Um, so yeah, so lots of good stuff. Um, I don't think there's anything really bad um, to report um, or ugly. So I'm not really blocked by anything except for you know if anybody has any other. Uh, Feedback on the schema. I know Ken just said something about um, you know putting the the paths in a in a, in a separate um, table um, so that we don't have to repeat the path for every single row on the sample table. And I may go ahead and do that. Um, but yeah, unless there's anything else, I'll just continue to go forward coding with what I have now. And any um, luck in the next few days, I'll have. I'll be at the point where maybe we can start talking about the taggers. Uh, quick question, Chris. The uh, Mycroft core code won't have to change, right? You'll just be backward compatible with it? Um, it won't have to. I mean, it will. Okay, it won't have to change. I think for 2008, I'd like to see it change to be. Um, actually, no, it will have to change. I may have to support both for a while because. The, the interface and core to deal with the public API is in a whole different part of core than, I mean, basically this API call is just stuck in the audio service right now um, directly instead of using the API mechanism in core, which is what the rest of the public API uses. So if that's going to break compatible, I don't know. I don't know if we reveal, release that as a minor version, if that's going to impact compatibility or not. But since we've got the major version coming up, 2008, um, maybe we just include this as part of 2008 um, using this this new API instead of the old API. Any thoughts? be coming up very quickly, just in the context of, you know, we're talking like three weeks. Yeah, and I, I shouldn't have any problem meeting, meeting that date, and I can, I can do the changes to core myself. They're not, yep. It's not rocket science. It's not really hard. It's just, you know, it is going to be calling this a different API with some different arguments. Than yeah, I didn't think, the, didn't think the core stuff would be difficult just in terms of having the backend services ready. Yeah, so if I just, so what I'm hoping is if I just, this part of the project, this upload part, um, once I have everything tested, I could do a release of Selene that will um, go up with um, 
the core release, basically. We can just we can um, we can coordinate it either that or we can support both API calls initially, and then you know then remove the support for the old API call after we're happy that the new one is working. And just just oh well, never mind, scratch that. That's not going to work. So yeah, we just have to coordinate. Uh, we just have to coordinate moving 2008 and the newest version of Selenium together. Well, I don't think that's going to work either, right? We need to be able to, uh, like, if we're going to change an API such that, yeah, you know, we're talking about, you know, this, you're talking about changing the Selenium API, right? Yeah. And so we need to be able to, to, be able to keep those backwards compatible. Yeah, okay. that's, that's kind of the, the point I was surfacing. Yeah, part of the problem. Yeah, that, so the point, the point I was surfacing, and all the points you guys made are valid too, is if you're planning on adding authentication, then you're basically deprecating the existing API. I'm deprecating the existing endpoint, yes. Well, yeah, I mean, the existing endpoint, therefore, all core will all all users that have core checked out will have to upgrade or their code will break that that's the only warning i was throwing out there now this is in terms of submitting samples right yeah so can yeah so we're gonna have to put out i mean maybe we'll have to push out at like a minor update that um checks to make sure the api still works and then if it doesn't then, you know, basically just disables that function, right? So that well, I guess if we if we disable that because yeah, because we could just say that if you're running an old version of the software, that you know maybe that endpoint that it's it's being called right now redirects somehow or something like that. We could redirect some. I, I don't. Well, know. basically, we're saying that like you know, if you have an old version of the software, you can't upload sample files, right? Is that the issue? Yeah, that, that would basically okay. be it. And we could just put some minor update into like 20, well. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as, long as, that, as long as that code doesn't <coughs> crash, I'll have to check. As long as it just like says, oh, I got a bad return code, big deal, and logs it, mm -hmm. well, I think we'll be fine. Yeah, um, exactly, that's my point, is that we need to yeah. expect that if it tries to upload a file and the endpoint doesn't respond or whatever, then uh, you know, core at least doesn't crash. It just fails gracefully and says, okay, well, I, I couldn't upload that sample, you know? Um, the, the, yeah, this shouldn't, this shouldn't be a breaking change that causes things to crash. No, it okay. shouldn't. And is that okay that we don't, that, you know, I don't know what adoption rate we have for new major versions, if that's going to really hinder our wake word collection capabilities or not. But... Yeah, I, I'm not too worried about it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that the important thing is that we, establish a process for doing this gracefully, right? So if we're gonna break something, if we're gonna break an endpoint, we first test that we can break that endpoint gracefully without, you know, causing problems. So, I mean, we should break it now. We should break it for 2002 now and, um, you know, and test that it's working fine. Okay, hey. and working fine, just meaning we get a return code, maybe if something's logged in a logger and that's fine. Exactly. Okay, I will. Uh, I'll do that first. I'll just, you know, I'll, uh, I'll check that, check core, and see how that works. Uh, it may be fine already. <laughs> it may not be a change we have to make. It may just do that now. And if that's the case, then we will be fine when we, when we move to the new one. We'll just stop getting submissions from other people. I, I, right. I, I suspect well, yeah, that it's it actually going to be a bigger deal than that, though, because I, I imagine that it wasn't set up to have the service just like disappear. So, but I'd also like the user to be informed like, hey, you know, the wake word collection service has been disabled on your device, you know, some sort of notification somehow, whether it's either through Selini, you know, like an email notification. I don't know if we, we do those kinds of things now or through the device itself saying, you know, the, you know, wake word uh, collection has been disabled because of an API change, please upgrade to the next major version, you know, that sort of something like that. but. Not every time they, you know, not every time the user submits a sample, for example, like so, you know, so there's <laughs> some kind of logic there, right? That could get annoying, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so all I was getting at was that this is something that needs to be thought through. Um, and what would be ideal is if, since you already have the user account coming up into the request, that the new API be able to handle backward compatibility by detecting, if you're planning on changing the payload, by detecting the old payload and doing the authentication behind the scenes using the account ID rather than just breaking. Now, what I would say though, to just, to, just to add to what you were getting at Chris V, push comes to shove. If you have to throttle or shut down the sample collection for a period of time, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it because I have about a million five hundred thousand samples to go through. And so that will keep us busy for a while. And chances are by that time you'll have it figured out. So I wouldn't let that bother you um, that, you know, hey, the old stuff is not making its way into the endpoint. That would be OK. But I was kind of hoping we could just have an API that says, hey, this is an old style request. and He's not sending an authentication token, but I do know his account ID and yada, yada, yada. Uh, anyway, it's up to you. I, I just wanted to throw that out there, that that migration path is something to be considered if we pride on, so ourselves on only breaking or deprecating things at a major release level. Well, and, and regardless, even if we break things, we can't ever have a situation where we need to push out an update of any kind and an update on Selenium at the exact same moment and hope that they yeah. synchronize perfectly. That's just never going to happen, right? So, sure. Yeah, and just just on your point about authenticating with the account ID, that's not going to work either because the authentication mechanism for the device API right now is based on device ID, um, not account ID. It's got a different mechani mechanism than um, the rest of Selenium does. That's it's a legacy thing that we never changed. Um, so the way it is right now, authentication just wouldn't work, period. Um, unless we changed it to, again, send up device ID, that would be a, a breaking change that not everybody would have. So um, so yeah. I, I do also want to say that like we have a pretty good update rate. As we do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the big, the, the people that I see hold back, uh, you know, projects like Big Screen, Plasma Big Screen, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, keep things as stable as possible. And so they'll obviously sit back um, for a little bit uh, just because making that change is, is, all, is more work. Um, but in terms of users, you know. Like Mark 1 users or Pycroft users, those guys? Yeah, I think, I think we, we primarily see most people update. Um, I mean, there's still there's still people that run old software, and um, and so it's pretty useful that we have maintained a, a good upgrade path. So you know, even if you haven't had a Mark One plugged in for a couple of years, if you plug it in, it should it should be able to update itself all the way to to twenty o two or twenty o eight or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't. I think as long as it's not you know crashing everything, which I, I can't imagine it would. Um, then, yeah, I don't, I don't think we should be concerned. OK. Um, and that's, that's something else we're going to have to talk about. I think we talked a while ago about deprecating, like, 1902 at some point. Um, you know, how does deprecating that work with people who have enough or still running 1902, for example? You know, does that just break them and they have to re burn an image? Or, you know, what, what happens if that's, if that's actually the case? I, I don't know um, what the answer to that is. but. If we are going to start deprecating uh, really old core versions, we're going to have to be able to handle that somehow. Well, I think the rule is has to be something like: uh, first, we have to give them warning, and secondly, if we're going to break something in terms of like not supporting a service anymore, or their their 1902 install will just stop working, we have to ensure that at least the upgrade path still works, right? So they haven't upgraded yet and they they have to go to at least 2002 to you know uh to access the system then that's fine as long as they can update to 2002 right yeah so you know we need to have some yeah we need to start i'm not even sure how to put it like i mean we need to have the institutional uh instincts you know 
to make sure that we don't, um, you know, we're trying to keep people online as long as possible and keep, keep the, um, you know, keep things that we haven't very explicitly decided are going to uh, not be supported, you know, from working. So, yeah. And it's probably gonna be a while before we have to worry about deprecating a, an old major version, but just wanted to kind of put it on people's minds. Yeah, and along those lines, Michael, regarding this issue, if the old API endpoint doesn't get destroyed, um, and if we don't want to maintain the exact same DNS, which I think is like training.mycroft.something, then Chris could prop up the new API and the two of them could peacefully coexist. And then the upgrade to core would go to the new API, therefore not breaking any of the old devices. And when they upgraded, they would move to the new one. And so right. all I was getting at is we need to think it through. That's all. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I'd rather not support two endpoints, but um, to do the same thing if we can avoid it. Well, I'd rather support two endpoints than have a bunch of our devices stop working. So, you know. Okay. One way or the other, you know, we need to make sure that we're not uh, um, we're not borking people's devices. I I, I agree with that one hundred percent. I guess at some point, you know, what what do we do if you know? In this case, we're we're re-architecting something. You know, are we just are we completely eliminating ourselves for doing too much re-architecting if we wanted to do it just because there's you know, um, I don't know. I did. It's, it's, In this particular know, it's, case, I don't think it's that big a deal because you know, like Ken said, if if the only result is that people can't upload, you know, we're not recording their wake words or or whatever, um, then that's that's not a loss to us, and we just need to make sure that they're informed if they were, and and it's really no loss to the to the user at this point either because we haven't really exposed them to the data. You know, the only thing they can do with that data data right now is delete it. Um, so it's not really much of a loss for the user, but it, under the new system, it would be you know a different story. Um, but of course, under the new system, this isn't an issue. So, so the point being that as long as you know, for this particular case, I think as long as you know devices don't stop working, um, if we want to stop supporting that endpoint, I think it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and right. to be clear, what we're talking about is a post, like a post request failing. Like we're not talking about, like that's it. It's just right. a, sim a single, yeah, post request. That's yes. So I think yeah. But if I turn off that 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 old URL, um, yeah, I'll have to find out. Like if it, if it takes a while to get like a if it gets like a five hundred two or a five hundred four or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. You'll have to make sure that's not going to cause problems. Well, and, and I think we do turn that off in 2002 before we upgrade to 2008 so that, you know, if people are sticking to 2002 but they're doing those minor point releases, they're not, like, arbitrarily trying to post, you know, audio files to a, to an endpoint that doesn't exist because that's just pointless. But, you know, if there's someone sitting on 1808 or something and they're uploading files into the world, then they should try and update. <laughs> Okay, I'll take a little detour starting now to make sure that so since we have limited amount of time for 2008 comes out, I'll take a small detour and make sure that you know that's we're not going to break anything if we turn that off, um, and if you know if when I need to make a a change somewhere, um, I will. But okay, I'll, I'll look Great. into that. Chris, where are you uh, deploying this um, this new back end to? Um, it's it's on um, a different server than the current server, correct? No, it's going on the same place. It's, it's the same API. It's the same. It's, it's going to be and part of the same API it uses for that the device uses for anything it, it communicates with Selenium for. No, no, no. What I'm saying is the existing machine where this data gathering is running. You're planning on creating your server in a different server than that server, correct? Yeah, I mean, it'll be running on the same server the current that runs the public API now. Right, which will be different than where yes. the server is today. Yeah, because right, right now this is running in um, on the Iron at Wicked, and the new API run or the existing device API runs in the cloud. Right, so you will need to figure out with Josh um, how to expose the NAS to your server 
if that's your intent to be able to move those files each evening into the NAS. Um, well, I mean, SSH I is available, available which means SCP yeah. works. I'm sorry, what's that? So SSH is available, which means that SCP works. So, um, you know, that's, that was my plan was just use SCP to copy them over. Yeah, that probably work. Um, just so you know, I mean, I'm, I'm planning on asking them to expose that NAS to Lambda 2 since it makes no sense to have to SCP the files from one server to the other um, when the Lambda 2 is the training server, right? He, he's the guy that needs the files and he doesn't have a mount to where they are. So I actually have to, you know, pull them out and zip them up and SCP them over and, and use them. But I'm going to ask Josh to put a mount to that NAS on Lambda 2 uh, to forego that. So I was just thinking you might want to do that too. But yeah, you could SCP them too. That's fine. So Ken, um, is that's not really a mount really won't be useful to you until the directory structure issue is sorted out, right? Yeah, in other words, right now, Lambda 2 is where the training gets done. That's the uh, the big, fast, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, Lambda server. And uh, he doesn't have access to the data we have. Right. So I actually had to pull it off of the NAS on the existing machine and copy it over. Right, but if it was just um, a mount, it would be incredibly slow, right? Because now you're not just dealing with the fact that the you know, it's got a million files in one directory, but you've, you're also dealing with the fact that it's not actually physically in the machine, so you're going over the network. Right, but the assumption is eventually that mount will be where the files are placed each day, and then each night a cron will move them into their corresponding proper subdirectory. And so the assumption would be that those files would also be on that mount, and that that mount would be where the entirety of all this data lives since it's, you know, rapidly approaching two, gig, two terabytes, and that mount has eight terabytes. So short of firing up a new server somewhere with four or five terabytes, then I was trying to figure out how we can reuse the existing resource, uh, even though it happens to live under a bunch of water. Uh, and so, yeah, um, that's where I was going with that, was that it's wonderful that we have a big drive that we can store the files on, it's a shame nobody else can get them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I get it. Yeah. You're. It's a write-only write storage device, effectively. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've, yeah. I know. You, so you've got two problems to solve. You need to get it into this directory so the performance of the machine itself is reasonable, and then you need to make it accessible to the, the Lambda training server. So. Okay. Exactly. You're going to work I that was... out with Josh. Yep. yep. Okay. Great. Um. One extra thing. This whole discussion is. Uh, reminded me is that um uh yeah i'm gonna prioritize the 2008 shift over the next well yeah particularly over the next week because i think i think it'd be worth doing a, an extra point release for 2002 so that you know people that are sticking on that have all the latest updates there and then you know we can we can do the breaking changes for 2008 um and uh yeah this will be my first uh my first one so <laughs> um uh, I will be, you know, asking for help uh, at points, but um, um, but yeah, I just want to make sure I'm I'm not, you know, leaving it to August thirty first or whatever. Yeah, I, I think there's a twenty eight. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I just... twenty eight sprint out there, right? I think so. I mean, do we have any breaking changes yet to be made? Uh, uh, I've got a few um, that. I want to make. Okay. Um, that we're starting that I'll be listing out. And so, yeah, the plan is to, to list those out um, so that we can know what we want to do and you know discuss whether or not we're going to do those, um, and then get the point release up, um, so then we can get back to the the breaking changes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I assume Okay's been in touch with you. He's offered to help with this release. Yeah. Yes, and I have graciously accepted his assistance. <laughs> All right. So should we have either a separate meeting or, or so devote a dev sync, upcoming, upcoming dev sync to what's going to go into 2008? Um, I think that you should have a separate meeting for that. OK. And uh, yeah, Gez, how about you schedule that? Um, cool. 
And so uh, I think Chris pointed out we haven't really been, someone pointed out that we haven't really been um, following the, the ticket system. And I think that that's, uh, that's a mistake. Um, I think I do want to keep these meetings more efficient, uh, but I think that we also do need to keep track of, uh, of the work that we're uh, doing. And so I, I, want to, I want to keep that, um, you know, those instincts to, you know, log what you're doing uh, in the ticket system or what you're going to work on. I want to, I want to keep that going, right? Because um, it's going to be more important, a lot more important when we start to have more people on the team. But, uh, but already, you know, I, I, I can see that there's, there's been a little drift here, uh, at least from what I expected. And so I want to make sure we stay on top of that. Um, so, uh, so let's make sure that we're logging uh, the, you know, the work at least for the next upcoming week into the into the system, so we can keep track of it. And if you don't know where to put it, um, then uh, well, we should have a discussion about that. But um, maybe we need to bring back, or maybe we need to have more frequent meetings. To be honest, I, I think these meetings going over an hour isn't super useful or you know comfortable for anyone. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of you know there's a lot of stuff to talk about and I assume you guys are in you know communication throughout the week um, you know outside of these meetings uh, but maybe that's not enough you know I mean uh, it's it's a little bit tricky timing wise because you know, you know uh, all the different time zones we have to cover um, so that might be you know maybe we should have a discussion about how we can address that maybe we need to have some meetings that don't necessarily include everyone. Um, but at least you know keeping people up to date on what's going on. So, um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any feelings about that. But I think that um, you know I want to keep the momentum going, and I don't want us to like you know losing two or three days uh, if there's a something out of sync um, is you know it's kind of a big deal for us right now. So um, I don't. Does anybody else have a, a sense of whether or not this is a, a, a real issue now or if um, is it just my perception because I'm a little bit more I've, I've been more focused on the fundraising side of things and less on the uh, development side for the last little while here. Might be a um, maybe it's you worth having a, a separate meeting aside from this update that we publish to everybody to just go through the board and make sure we're you know just and from a very task oriented not not like questions or just these are kind of discussions but you know. Make sure we're all, um, you know, the board is where we think it should be, and it is you know reflects what we what updates we've made and what progress we've made. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Like maybe on Mondays we should review the board, and then um, throughout the week a couple of times we could just have quicker check-in times. You know, we just say, hey, um, how are you doing? Is there anything blocking you? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and um, you don't necessarily have to refer to specific tickets at that point in time, but you know, at least once a week, check on the uh, on the progress of um, and so that you know the pace of of getting through the the work that we are expecting to get through, but throughout the week, you know, still touching base to make sure that you know things aren't getting caught up. So yeah, maybe that's um, maybe that's the, the way to go. Instead of having two meetings a week where we kind of basically do the same thing in both meetings, maybe we could have you know, uh, well. A meeting on Monday and then a couple of meetings on, you know, maybe Wednesday and Friday. To, yeah, uh, it's a quicker check-in. Yeah, I'm not sure the the uh, community really cares about our Jira board, so the, <laughs> that part could be the, you know, an unrecorded part of the meeting, and then we could do all this discussion, you know, um, as part of the uh, what we're sharing. Yeah, maybe maybe not. I think uh, I think certainly the planning uh, aspect of putting those sprints together and that sort of thing, um, you know, might be of interest to people, but, um, but yeah, they do tend to be a little bit, uh, drawn out and somewhat tedious. Well, maybe we can work on that too, somehow. <laughs> yeah, I think the key comes back to like, you know, not just doing it in the, in those check-ins or in the meetings as well, right? So it's like, you know, if you guys wanted to meet and I couldn't make the time, I would just commit to like making sure that those tickets were absolutely up to date um, each day before you guys met. So, um, yeah. And I think 
they're also very painful now because we have a lot of different things going on. You know, the more focused we are on, you know, one or two tasks, you know, the more we can just talk about those one or two tasks, but we've got, you know, it seems like we're kind of in a lot of different places right now. So that, that there's a lot more to talk about, right? <laughs> well, I, I think yeah. this is actually going to be a problem, you know, forever. We, there are <laughs> a lot, there are a lot of pieces here, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, we need to find a way to be able to communicate effectively about it. Like when the, as the team grows, you know, we're going to get somebody in here who's dedicated to watching, you know, the overall process instead of having me, you know, being kind of split and Chris kind of doing some of it and, you know, that kind of thing. We will have somebody who's dedicated to just, you know, making sure that, um, you know, we have a plan and we're sticking to the plan. And if the plan needs to change that we do it in a thoughtful way. Uh, right now, you know, we're small enough and, and we should be able to, you know, if we were all in the same room, you know, every day, you know, we could draw on the whiteboards and whatnot. We, I don't think we'd, you know, be having a, a little bit of a different experience than we are right now. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't think we're really losing a lot in terms of efficiency uh, by being distributed. But I do think that we're, we're losing a little bit. And um, so I just want to tighten that up a little if we can. Makes sense. Okay, so. Uh, with that being said, um, today's Thursday. We'll uh, let's meet again on Monday. Let's plan to go through the Jira tickets. Um, I would. I don't want to make that into a meeting where we like discuss uh, status as much as we do discuss maybe plans. So uh, let's just make sure that going into the meeting, prior to the meeting, all of your status is up to date. Um, and you put in all the tickets that you anticipate working on for the week, for that week, at least for that week, um, into the system prior to the meeting. And so we'll have everything there in the meeting and we can just discuss, okay, well, what are our priorities, you know, and, uh, and how, you know, how are we, uh, uh, dependent on, you know, each other's work and that sort of thing. So, all right. Sounds good. Cool. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of good progress. I'm excited about the new wake word collection system and getting a new, um, you know, the, the system in its entirety uh, up to speed. And I'm um, I'm really looking forward to trying out the new wake word uh, model that Ken sent me. I did do a, a little bit of uh, testing with uh, with my wife, and uh, the hit rate on the current model is abysmal. So it'll be really easy to tell if there's a difference with the new one. <laughs> Should be pretty easy. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, okay. Thanks, everybody. I'll uh, keep you apprised of any hardware updates uh, over the weekend if, as we get them too, because I know that's of interest to everybody. Absolutely. All right. Have a all good right. evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you,